This is the Ethanol Report, the industry podcast from the Renewable Fuels Association since 2008. I'm Cindy Zimmerman. The Washington, D.C. Auto Show is one of the biggest car shows in the business, known as the public policy show on the auto show circuit, drawing the attention of officials in government, industry, and the media. There are hundreds of vehicles on display at this event, but only one that's designed to run on anything from electricity to regular gasoline to 85% ethanol. The Renewable Fuels Association is showcasing the world's first plug-in hybrid electric flex fuel vehicle this week at the Washington, D.C. Auto Show. And Vice President of Industry Relations and Market Development, Robert White, is there. Well, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle that we converted to flex fuel roughly a year ago uh, last January was in part to demonstrate not only to consumers, but to politicians, to regulators, to the administration, in fact, uh, that we have technology that's at our fingertips today that can meet or exceed the goals of the future, and we don't need to go fully battery electric vehicle uh, to do it. And so this year-long process of emissions testing, the fuel economy uh, testing to life cycle analysis to cost of ownership to convenience and we, we've logged all of this data and we're finally ready to release a lot of that to the public and we thought what better place to be than the dc auto show one of the biggest in the country and right in the backdrop of the nation's capital where most of the people making these decisions live and breathe tell us about how how many miles you've driven over the last year where you've gone and uh Just some of the things that you've learned. Well, we've covered the countryside pretty well, a little over 27,000 miles and right out of here. And it has gone across the country twice. Uh, D.C., obviously, down to Florida, up to Minnesota, down into Texas, and obviously out to California when we did the emissions testing. And we'll be headed back there uh, for the National Ethanol Conference next month in San Diego. Uh, So all parts in between, we've experienced all weather scenarios from 110 plus to uh, last week in, in Kansas City and, and many parts of the country were well below zero. And so we've we've really got the data points on how the electricity performs, how the EV side of this vehicle performs, and also on the E85 side. And that's everything from fuel cost to range to cost per mile. And uh, at no surprise, probably to most of your listeners, is that the ethanol side has been competing at every level, and in some cases, beating the electric vehicle. What kind of emissions data do you have specifically that you can point to, the numbers that people want to know? Yeah, so the the most important ones that came out of the University of California Riverside Emissions Laboratory was the NOx and particulate matter. Those are really the the emissions that CARB and and EPA are kind of honing in on for uh, good reason, right? And it's something that when we look to the overall emissions that those two tend to pop up for consumer health as much as anything. And what we saw actually kind of surprised us. It, we saw uh, NOx emissions in, in a couple different cycles, which is the one cycle is where you test fuel economy and emission certification. And the other one is kind of really how we actually drive and, and why sometimes that fuel economy on the window sticker is hard to actually accomplish because it's not really how we drive as Americans. Uh, but b- between those two, we saw an, a more than 70% reduction in NOx. And then on the particulate matter, it was not much different. And when we did the testing, we tested E10, E30, and E85 in and, and various scenarios, cold start, hot start. Um, but when you broke down the averages, the ethanol uh, was well up into that 50-plus uh, uh, savings on emissions on every level. Uh, but most of the time was hovering well above that 70% savings. One of the things you mentioned was how cold it got, and we've seen stories about electric cars not starting because it's so cold. And so your vehicle doesn't have that problem, does it? No, it doesn't. It, it's you know the small battery it has is roughly a 14 kilowatt battery. Uh, you know some of the Teslas, for example, will get closer to that 100 kilowatt range, and so they're they're different animals for sure. But that's part of why we chose this vehicle and chose plug-in hybrids as as an option because. When you get into those situations where uh, range is an issue, you still have 11 gallons of liquid fuel that can be filled at any convenience store, any gas station in the country. And on the EV side, we have seen exactly what you're reading in the headlines. The range that 
is usually there is somewhere in that 37 mile mile range. We've seen it all the way down to 19, which is almost a 50% drop uh, due to nothing else but temperature. And this is, you know, vehicle at home is charged in a heated garage. It's get, getting all of the things that the EV enthusiasts say will help that range, but it's not. And I think you're, we're starting to see that specifically through the Midwest and Northeast as this cold uh, and low temps have blanketed that, that part of our country. Um, but I can tell you the beauty of this, again, is that you have that luxury and a backup plan um, already at your fingertips and, and something you can fill up at, you know, 140,000 gas stations across the country. Well, and unlike a regular battery electric vehicle, which has to be charged in a new way, it's it's a learning curve for someone who goes directly from a liquid fuel vehicle to an electric vehicle. This flex fuel electric vehicle runs just like a regular vehicle, and you can run it on electricity, right? Right, it's exactly the, the the case. I mean, if you take it home, and if you have think about it, if you have the time, if you have the infrastructure, you plug it in, and the next day you've got roughly that 37 miles of range on the battery alone, and then it kicks over into an internal combustion engine that has 11 gallons of fuel, and with a off the shelf conversion kit, we made sure that we could use any blend of ethanol from zero to 85 percent. Uh, the bulk of the fuel outside of a couple different uh, E10 or E15 tanks to get across the country, uh, it's all been E85. And so, um, you know, there are, but you don't have to use E85. I like guess it's a flex fuel vehicle. So if E85 is not readily available, you still fuel up and you keep going. And that's a luxury that EV owners don't have. And many are learning the hard way that uh, between the uh, J.D. Power recent study that showed and highlighted that, you know, in many cases, sometimes up to 30 percent of the chargers are not working. That could be not willing to communicate with your phone or not being able to accept payment or the screens broke or the cables been yanked off the charger. Whatever those cases are, if you have battery only, that gets to be a pretty precarious position where, especially if you're low on battery and, and in these temperatures that we're experiencing today, uh, whereas our vehicle, you could go a month, six months, a year without ever charging it and operate just as a normal vehicle does for uh, that most of us have today. Well, how much does it cost? Because we all know that EVs are pretty expensive. Yeah, and that's that was part of the research too, is comparing it. And so this vehicle uh, was right at $40,000 to leave the Ford lot a year ago, and we spent roughly $600 on the conversion kit. Uh, the gasoline-only equivalent of this vehicle, uh, which is just a Ford Escape, would be uh, slightly less. Uh, you do get part of a, a tax credit if you qualify um, because it is part EV. Um, and then you flip over into something that would be equivalent, and really it's the Volkswagen ID4 um, battery electric vehicle that is the equivalent to the escape same very similar size and shape and seating and cargo space and it's another seven or eight thousand dollars so um, this particular point and, and part of it is you know what it takes to build an ev uh, you've probably heard toyota's number that you can build one battery electric vehicle or you can build six to nine plug-in hybrids or you can build 90 regular hybrids and it's all about the minerals and the components that go into the battery of these vehicles and so the more of those you have the more expensive it tends to get because of not only their costs and rarity but where they're coming from as well you mentioned uh, having to use a conversion kit for this now that's converting it to be able to you to be a flex fuel vehicle to be able to use up to 85 percent ethanol because we're not having that many or any really FFVs being produced commercially anymore right that that these hybrids are all just regular they can take up to 15 percent ethanol gas but not up to 85 percent am I right that is correct and it's really about the corporate average fuel economy credits that used to go to flex fuel vehicles uh, under the Obama administration those were redirected towards EVs and that's part of the main incentive why automakers uh, are so excited about EVs because they are able to hit tailpipe standards and fuel economy standards and also get paid on top of that to build a vehicle. So it's a very lucrative 
effort and why we had so many flex fuel vehicles back in the day. But now there's no credit, no system uh, to reward those automakers. But we do and have been trying for some time. We do have current legislation both in the House and the Senate around the Flex Fuel Fairness Act. And really, it doesn't knock EVs. It's not an attack on EVs. But in in uh, the federal government, an EV is assumed to be running on 100% renewable electricity 100% of the time. Right now, there's not a plug in the country that could provide that source of power. Um, and so at the same time, they look at flex fuel vehicles and say they assume they never use the 85. And so really, it's just tipping the scale back to say, if you're going to assume an EV uses 100% renewable electricity, then you can assume that these flex fuel vehicles that would be produced in the future would also be using E85. And that really gets a, about, about a 31% gain on emission standards and overall greenhouse gas scoring for the automakers. So they have said, we believe, uh, our champions on the Hill believe that if that were to come to fruition, that we would have flex fuel vehicles. And right now, if you read the headlines, the automakers are looking for options. You know, the, the EV sales are, are a little down, uh, to say the least. And you're seeing cutbacks in Ford and General Motors and others. Uh, year-end sales were down as well year on year. And so the automakers are going to have another need another lever to pull when they're talking about how do we cut down on our, on our greenhouse gas emissions at the same time uh, accomplishing those tailpipe standards and fuel economy standards. And flex fuel vehicles can play that role. And what we've seen with this particular vehicle, it has a kind of a unique engine it is a 13 to 1 compression ratio, so something that's starred for octane, but only uh, Ford only requires 87. But when you start de decelerating or hitting the brake and it puts that engine under load to try and recharge the battery, that extra octane is what we found is benefiting it. And so right now at 27 plus thousand miles, we have a 40.0 mile per gallon rating on the car over its entire life. And that's exactly what EPA said on the window sticker that this car could accomplish. And so we're very proud of that fact. And we're demonstrating actually live that flex fuel vehicles, if the automakers do some extra due diligence, that you can have a fuel economy penalty that can almost be wiped away and at the same time save 20 to 30 percent a gallon on fuel. Well, and speaking of incentivizing flex fuel vehicles, uh, RFA just provided some input to California about that under their advanced clean cars regulations and and how just having more FFVs in the state using E85 would would help to cut emissions, right? Correct. And as California is a microcosm of what's going on in the entire country, these lofty uh, emissions goals, these lofty battery electric vehicle adoption rates are not being hit. And California, the California Resources Board, just like the automakers I mentioned earlier, they're all experiencing a, a pullback or a slowdown, and they know that those goals are not attainable. So they're looking at other levers again. What can we do to continue to help and benefit our low carbon fuel standard in, in California's case uh, if we don't meet our goals? And we know there are going to be liquid fueled cars in California for decades to come. And there's going to be millions sold even before their, uh, at least their standing EV mandate down the road. And so why, why wouldn't you want to save those emissions today and help consumers save money today? And that's really what went into our comments there. And that's why the, the Flex Fuel Fairness Act at the national level came to fruition because our champions saw this car. And they saw how easy it was to do in, in many cases under an hour. But if the OEMs were to make flex fuel vehicles, it's a lot less expensive. It's not a, a burden on the individual consumer. It's technology that's there and ready and uh, when the consumer has that opportunity. And so we firmly believe the flex fuel vehicle will come back. We hope it's sooner rather than later uh, because we need uh, those vehicles in order to meet the goals that have been handed down to us. Well, another part of the story for your PHE FFV is, uh, as far as energy security and grid protection is concerned, you talked a little bit about um, the minerals that are used to make electric vehicle batteries, and we've heard a lot about, you know, concerns about how we're going to charge all the electric vehicles if everyone has one. So talk a little bit about how your vehicle stacks up as far as energy security and grid protection. 
Well, obviously around ethanol, we always talk energy security and, and having a product that's domestically produced. We don't have to import it. Something we can make from renewable products over and over again. And, that, and that's, I think, been well recognized. But when you jump into the electric vehicles, you're getting uh, battery components that are not coming from the U.S. You're getting vehicle components uh, outside of the battery that are not coming from the U.S. And so you have a reliance on that technology and those rare earth minerals that really likens to the reliance on foreign oil. And so we've done our best to uh, minimize our, our imports, especially from the Middle East, but now we're turning to a technology that would mean we're relying on China. And most people don't think that's a great idea. And uh, while you know many people may not understand all of those connections, but that's the reality of it. And then you cross over into you know, the electricity and where will the power come from? I mean, we, we saw last year where uh, Governor Newsom doubled down on his EV mandate and three days later asked everyone in the state not to turn their air conditioner below 78 degrees. The power is not there today for the existing demand and everyone's supposed to go home and buy a, an EV and plug in. The reality is that uh, we still have a lot of reliance on fossil fuels for our energy, and that varies tremendously from state to state. Uh, Kansas, for example, where I reside, is pretty strong in renewables, but I only have to go 30 miles to the east in Missouri, and, and that's not true. Uh, last Yesterday, I was up in New York, and upstate New York, upwards of 80% renewable. You get down to New York City, and it's barely 20%. So the the emission savings from these vehicles actually vary depending on where they're plugged in. And I think that's not known. And when you get to energy security, it, again, it all comes full circle. Where's the power coming from? And where are the battery components and the other components of the vehicle coming from? And I think it's important for the American consumer to understand that and appreciate it and know their options. And that's why we think this vehicle highlights that quite well. And also at the same time, further highlights that E85 can fulfill that domestic seed as well. Well, I was looking at the schedule for this Washington, D.C. auto show, and it's it's a long show. Uh, are you guys there for the duration? It is a long show. I'm going to disappear in the middle. Uh, we have staff and members coming in to help us uh, cover the days. There's several 10-hour days, and it's 10 days long. So it'll have a, a lot of eyes. They're expecting hundreds of thousands of people to come through. Uh, I followed a Lamborghini in. Uh, they do have the exotics out here that they're, I'm staring at them right now. And right uh, behind me was a Lucid, which is a couple hundred thousand dollar EV. So you're going to see it all. Uh, we hope that not only do the locals come in, um, but our, our elected, uh, you know, our politicians come in and take a look and, and learn a little bit. Because I think what you're going to see is you have it all on display from some of the uh, most prestigious internal combustion engines on the planet to the full electric vehicles. And here we are sitting in the EV pavilion with our flex fuel plug-in hybrid, and we're excited to show it off. Not only that, hopefully you get some good media attention there, not only from, you know, from national media that will be covering it, but also the, uh, the trade publications, the auto industry publications. Yeah. Yeah, we hope so. I mean, we're definitely doing some pitching and, and hope to get their attention. And then after the show, we are actually going to put out the uh, the invite for reporters to take a first spin. And you know, we've seen the articles over the last couple of years where some good, some bad. When the reporters take a battery electric vehicle and, and they pick a route and and some of the stories are pretty colorful. And we know that if we can get them behind the wheel of this vehicle, uh, one, they will notice that it's no different than uh, a normal car, but they'll have essentially multiple options for fueling it and getting that down the road. And there's, we are very confident they're not going to be stranded or needing a tow truck because they ran out of energy. And so that's kind of the next step from here. Uh, obviously, it's headed out to California uh, in the coming weeks for the National Ethanol Conference, and we have some plans up and down the the Sunshine State as well. So uh, looking forward to the next chapter, but we're also very excited to get this data out to the public and hopefully uh, more and more people can learn more about their options uh, beyond just the full battery electric vehicle. Now that will be great to have a reporter drive the car. So keep us posted on that. Meanwhile, if you can't be at the Washington DC auto show, you can find out more about the plug-in hybrid electric flex fuel vehicle, P H E F F V 
by visiting flexfuelev.com. That's flexfuelev.com. And that's the Ethanol Report. Thanks for listening.